Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Praise the Lord. Praise Him. Amen. It's so good to see you. I'm, I'm a little more rested than that guy. Uh, I mean, he, he's smiling, but he's happy, but he's tired, but uh, not me. Someone said, I guess you're going to preach like an hour today. I'm, I'm not going to do that, but I do have a lot on my heart, uh, but I'll just spread that out over the days to come. It's so good to be back with you. We've got a great, I've had a great crowd today, and thank you so much. Yes, praise the Lord. It's so good to be with you. God is so good. And uh, we're so thankful to be here with you today. Thank you, church family. When we come together like you do at maybe some of your uh, family reunions, you know, everybody's got to give and take a little bit. You know, you got the crazy uncle, he shows up and everybody's got to uh, adjust a little bit. And thank you for doing that uh, today. We're so thankful. I, um, I thought about just bringing a slideshow and then I realized that we'd, way too many people would walk out, you know, during it. So I'm not going to do that today, but I do want to share a little bit of what's happened. Um, Stacy and I have had a wonderful time I say, I say Stacy and I, we get to see family. Uh, Stacy will tell you that um, if it was good for me, it was even better for her uh, to be away. And again, if you're a guest, many of you are today, uh, we've been away for the summer. I'm so grateful to the church family for the leadership that has seen it necessary for a senior pastor, senior leader in the church to take a time away like this. And I'm better for it. And you're, we're going to be better for it. Uh, the life of a pastor is a crazy life and, and time to get away, have some weekends and, and not just not being in meetings, you know, and preparing sermons each week was a, a different thing, but it's what I do. And so I, I'm so glad to be back and so grateful. Uh, we love you. I love you more than I ever have. And I've missed you. It was kind of strange in that regard that I'm not here with people that I love. So it's good to be back. And many of you are serving uh, on Sunday mornings. How many of you, I'm curious, how many of you are, are teaching maybe children the early hours, uh, young people, you're greeting? Yes, I know we've had lots of folks. It takes hundreds of people who are serving. I know Stacy has welcomed her new class of kids, children this morning. We were in North Carolina, just real quick, briefly. Uh, we were there at the beginning of the summer to see my mom and extended time with her and my brothers have family there. So uh, we were able to spend some time there. We were in Charleston right out of, uh, outside of, I mean, beyond that. How many of you have been to Charleston, South Carolina, right? Beautiful spot. Um, all my years on the East Coast, I've never really spent any time there. I was actually a part of a, a national leaders gathering uh, on the um, anniversary of the Mother Emanuel AME Church, the, the Massacre of the Nine. I was there on that Sunday with Pastor Brian Carter and others. We were invited to be a part of a leadership gathering there, but I uh, had a wonderful time. From there, uh, we saw Emily and Luke. Uh, I have twin daughters. Emily recently married, and we got to see them. Went to Malibu, California to see them because that's where they live, and somebody has to go visit those people. <laughs> and so we did that and had a great time. We had a leaders conference we were part of out there as well. But a good part of the time, or some of the time, we were just here. Some, some thought we were kind of gone, all gone, but we were just in Dallas where we love to be. But again, not, you know, preparing sermons and working, but, but dreaming and praying. And then we were here uh, during that horrific uh, moment in the history of our city, and God gave us favor, as uh, we noted, to speak into that. We're going to do that in the days to come. Uh, we're going to talk about issues that create fear and why there's such conflict in our, our country, even in our city in these days. I was at the University of British Columbia where, uh, for a week um, where there's uh, Regent College is a part of uh, that university. It's a, a school theology there and had an incredible time. I sat under J.I. Packer for a week. Um, if you know anything about him, one of the most influential theologians of our day, I should say the past two generations. He turned 90 
while we were there, sharp as he can be. And uh, it was just great sitting under him. Went to other uh, seminars and gatherings, events there. It was just a wonderful time being back in school. Now, some of y'all are like, oh, we got to start school tomorrow. But for me, uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And then we were uh, at, in Colorado just a couple of weeks ago where I spoke at a family uh, ranch there and uh, Christian ranch, and, and uh, we had our whole family there with us. But I've been to churches in, in, in our area, I've been to churches all around, but have been here in our area. And I wanted to tell you that, um, I guess I can say this, uh, very encouraged by what the Lord is doing right here in our church. And I mean that as we exalt Christ, as our worship leaders point us to Jesus alone, as we preach the word of God and the gospel. And I I am so thankful for what what God is doing right here. Never been more excited. And our future is bright. I also was commissioned by Stacy to do a painting, something, some of you know I'm an artist. So here's my painting I did for for, uh, us. Yeah, well, thank you. Okay. Um, now it is starting to feel like a slideshow, but, uh, this, this is entitled, it's in our, it's in our house and it's entitled sabbatical. Okay. So I thought that was good. Every time we look at it, we'll think of that moment. We were at wild dunes outside of Charleston and we'll just thank the Lord for you and the opportunity you afforded to us to have some time away. And we praise the Lord for you. So we, we prayed for you every day. I can't, st- of course, I do that anyway, but I'm, I can't stop praying for you. I've listened to all the sermons and kept up with all that's happening. But big thanks to our staff, our great staff for uh, extra work, in, uh, you know, put on them in my absence. So I'm so thankful. I love you more than I ever have. So we, we celebrate uh, a great summer together. Of course, that means kids that school starts tomorrow. And uh, some of you young parents, can I get an amen? All right. So that starts tomorrow. Uh, the Olympics are over, I think. Is that right, today? So if you're like me, just go back to it. I've got nothing to watch on television. I have nothing that I want to watch. Uh, maybe, you know, the big debate this weekend has been, uh, is it Usain Bolt who just wins everything that he's a part of? Or is it Michael Phelps, the greatest Olympian ever? Uh, maybe you, you saw this um, after he won the 100 and the 200 meters. He evidently won uh, gold playing whack-a-mole at Chuck E. Cheese's. And um, that's kind of, so maybe he is the greatest, uh, winning the you know, stuffed animals. I don't know. But uh, hey, then we'll, we'll press on, all right? Uh, but I do want you to come join uh, me tonight as we pray together. We know that we have great days ahead, but nothing happens uh, until we really call out to God to move among us. It's a great time, friends. Today's the day. This is the time. to to recommit, to give your life to the Lord fully. And if you're a guest, maybe you've been waiting, uh, today's the day. Join the fellowship of the church. We'll tell you more about how to do that later on. It's time to get in a connect group, get in a Bible study group. Uh, It's time. And we've got some great, great days ahead. So let's get started. I want you to turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Thank you for just letting me give you that update. We'll talk further in the days to come. Today, I want to encourage you. I want to bring an encouraging message to all of us. I want to talk about how to live our lives in this cultural moment. If you were here last week, Gabe Lyons spoke into that, O.S. Hawkins. Others have spoken into how we find ourselves in fearful times. And we're going to talk directly in, in these days to come about how we can live with faith, by faith in fearful times. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, while you're turning there, we're going to look at verses 1 through 18. I want you to consider uh, what's happened just over the summer. We've celebrated ministry, but I don't have to tell you that we live now in, uh, for, in my lifetime, uh, really what I think is the most conflicted, confused, maybe volatile, divided political season that we've ever seen. Uh, in my lifetime, certainly. Others may tell me otherwise. I've heard that this is such a unique moment. Uh, UK's departure from the European Union this summer lets us know we're not the only ones conflicted, right? There is so much that's happening in our world. As I was in Charleston, gathered with leaders around the nation, came to realize even more and more that the racial divide in our country uh, is deep, and we have a long way to go. And we're going to address that in the days to come. In fact, our women gathered yesterday with the Concord women. And then we have a men's event coming up. We're going to continue. You are critical 
as we bridge the gap and lead the way in our city. Terrorism threatens us domestically now, not just, uh, uh, you know, internationally. We see immigration, uh, sexual identification issues, abortion, financial disparity, uh, mental health, all top the news. While I was gone, it seemed weekly. It was June the 28th, 45 people killed by suicide bombers there in the Istanbul airport. July 7th, about a week later, our city was shaken to the core. A week to the day later, the massacre at the Bastille Day uh, event in Nice, France. On and on it goes. 84 people killed. This, of course, brings many of us, many people in our world, to great skepticism, even unbelief. And I'm watching believers who are shaken and concerned, and we don't know how to respond. So I want to speak into that today and in the days to come. Understandably, we could say we live in fearful times, but God's Word speaks into these days and in these moments because a few of us see these events as birth pangs of a coming new creation because God is at work in ways that we cannot see. Clearly, these are fearful times. But I want us to think, I want you to think more deeply today about the issues that you're facing and those things that are bringing fear and anxiety into your life. Because you see, I've said it before, our anxieties, think about it, your deepest emotions, fear, even anger, anxiety, and worry, those things point you to your idols. And I believe it's happening in the church today. So if we're honest about why we're fearful, it begins to point us to the fact that we have not trusted God. We're trusting in things other than God in many ways. So as you think about courage, I'm going to set it up this way. Courage is not doing whatever you want to do. This is what the world has come to believe. Our culture believes that. You just do whatever you want. How courageous are you? You just speak the truth and live like you want to. You're a courageous person. Listen, friends, courage is not doing whatever you want to do. We don't take into effect or, or into account the fact that every one of us has a fallen nature. Listen, I can tell you as your pastor, if I'm given over to whatever I want to do, that leads to self-destruction in my life, and it does in yours. Listen, courage is not doing whatever you want to do. Courage is doing what you ought to do. And what you ought to do is driven by conviction, and conviction comes by the Word of God. How can you be committed, how can you commit yourself to live as you ought to if you don't know the Word of God? And how can you be committed to something that's, that's wavering and changing? This is what is happening in our world today. So we get back to the Word of God through the Son of God, and by His Spirit, He leads us to what we ought to do. Courageous people follow God regardless of what's happening around them. And this is the church that we've, we've decided to be. It's where we're going to land today. Listen, here it is. As we live in fearful times, I want to say it. This is a great time to be a follower of Jesus. Because as we'll see today, our contrasting light in a world of darkness shines brighter than ever before. And the Word of God will tell us so. John said of Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it and it will not. As we live, others see Christ in us. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse 1, okay? I'll be reading from the ESV. Therefore, he says, and we always say, if it says therefore, what is it therefore? He's been talking about this new ministry that we have, this new truth. Now we have the Spirit. We're, we're driven by the gospel, not by the law. And so now instead of this ministry of death, he calls it, you know, Paul, what do you think about the law? He says, now we have the ministry of the Spirit that is guiding us in all things. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. This is the word today. I want you to see this. We're going to see a really a longer passage than we normally look at. I'm mostly going to read up to verse 16 where we see again, like bookends, we do not lose heart. I think in the King James it says, you might remember it says, we don't faint. We do not, and that literally, in kageo is the word in the Greek that means to faint, just pass out. Don't faint. 
Don't fall out. Don't lose heart. Friends, this is what we must hear today. Look at verse 2. But we renounce disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. We're not going to adjust it. Uh, just because culture shifts doesn't mean that we're going we're gonna to just kind of twist the word now, tamper with it a bit. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves. He's saying we're, gonna, we're not holding anything back. We're going to present ourselves as we are, fully devoted to Christ. We'll commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. You, you test for yourself as we live for Jesus. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled. That is, if it's not seen clearly, it's not, it's not our doing. It's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the, the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. And look at what he says. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we proclaim him. We proclaim him, not, this is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, for ourselves as servants, for Christ's sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He says, that is where the glory of God resides, right in the face of God is where we see it most clearly. And then he goes on, look at verse 7. But we have this treasure, this treasure, the light of the gospel in jars of clay. He's saying we may not look like much. In fact, it may look like we're beaten down. It looks like we're being oppressed or maybe we're weak and frail. But it's the way that God is at work to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. We can be honest about our our frailty. We can be honest about our weaknesses, even in our personal lives, because then it exalts him. Look at verse 8. We're afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're not demoralized, is what he would say there. We're perplexed. That is to say, we're not sure, but God is sure. We're not sure. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair because God knows what's happening. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Listen, you cannot experience a resurrection life in you until you died to yourself. This is what he's saying. In fact, he goes on to qualify it. He says, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. See, people can actually see Christ in us as we live our lives, trusting him, walking with him, even through challenging days. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal bodies, in our flesh. Verse 12, so that, or so, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. What he's saying here is, listen, this is true in our witness. You know, I may be getting the worst, but you're getting the best of what God's doing in and through me. Verse 13, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. He quotes from Psalm 116.10. What he's saying here is this, I believe it, so I said it. It's true It's the conviction of my heart. It's true. It's God's word. I believe it, so I spoke it. More on that here in a moment. We also believe, and we also speak, knowing that, here it is specifically, he raised the Lord Jesus. He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with him, with Jesus, and bring us with him into his presence. For it is all for your sake, I would say this is for everyone who is outside of the family and and for each other. It's for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. And now to close this chapter, I want us to read this together as a proclamation together, okay? Let's do it. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, 
Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Here's what I want you to do today. It's this. Forfeit fear for faith. I want you to forfeit your fear for faith. I want you to exchange your fear for faith. You say, how do I do that? Well, I want you to hold on to five key principles today. If you take notes on sermons, I'm going to apply this now, this great passage, and we're going to apply it to our lives before we close our time. Living by faith in fearful times. First of all, I want you to see your life is temporary. I want you to look at five key truths. If you embrace and practice these truths, it'll change your perspective even through troubled times. And listen, I want you to think about your personal life. What are you walking through right now? What, you can, what can you not see clearly? What is God up to? I want you to remember today, your life is temporary. You need to live with the end in sight. As Paul describes this uh, temporary life, he uses two words. You see them? Momentary in verse 17 and transient in verse 18. So one is immediate. It's in the moment. The other is this word uh, proskairos in the Greek. You see that, that, that prefix pros, like our pro. It means with or for. Kairos, you might have heard that before. It's a word for time. One of three key words for time in the Greek. It, it really means um, a, a, a fitting or decisive moment. You could say it, it also means opportunity. So think about this. Our lives are temporary. I guess it goes unsaid. Then it's an opportunity. It's temporary, and we have a moment in time. You could say all of your life is actually a Kairos moment. But my point here is today, I believe that we are living in a Kairos moment in time as a church, as the church in America, and as believers in our world. It is a Kairos moment. I'd say it this way, your life is temporary. You're a steward, and you're accountable. And we live in a moment, and now is the time for God's people to rise up. I think we return or think about a signature verse for us as a church. John chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus said, We must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, night is coming. When no, won't, no one can work, night cometh. We must live our lives with an urgency. This is not a dress rehearsal, friends. We've seen it in the Olympics. That, that, that athlete stands at the starting line, and it is in that moment, that moment is when they need to come through. Have you seen, like me, a couple of the athletes, they, they jump, uh, you know, the false start, and they're out, and they walk over in tears, and you just want to walk. You want to start crying for them. Friends, listen, we cannot squander this moment that will never come again as a church and in your life. And if you think that God is finished with you or that you don't have much time, listen, as long as you have breath, God has given you a Kairos moment to live for him and to serve him. Your life is temporary. Live with the end in sight. Secondly, your knowledge is finite. The Lord is at work in ways you cannot understand. What are you walking through right now? What are the challenges and difficulties in your life? If you trust the sovereign hand of God, then you will humbly come before him and recognize that you do not know what he knows. Your knowledge is finite. I know that I can, cannot understand, Lord, what you're doing and what is happening, but I know who loves me, and I can trust you. 1 Corinthians 2, 16, For who has understood the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And friends, the mind of Christ means that, yes, we can see things differently. We can see what is unseen. The mind of Christ, listen, is fixed on the will of God. Jesus would only do what the Father commanded him to do. He said, I'll only say what the Father 
tells me to say, the mind of Christ is fixed on the will of God, which we cannot understand. And whatever you're walking through, friends, be encouraged today. When your knowledge uh, is finite, you must focus on what you do know. And what we know, again, is found in his word. Too many of us are spending more time watching the news than we spend in the word of God. And you know what's, you know what's going to win out in your mind. We need to speak the truth of God into our lives. Focus on what you do know when you can't see how God is moving. He loves you. He's at work. He's all loving. He's all powerful. Now, thirdly, I want you to see this. Your vision is limited. So not only is is life temporary, your knowledge is finite, your vision is limited. That's, That's what he's saying here. We do not focus on what we see. We must fixate, we must obsess over what is not seen. God is at work in your life in ways you cannot see. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am fully known by him. You can't see what God is doing, but you can trust him. He is at work. Well, because of all of this, I want you to see this. Number four, your Savior is victorious. In the context of this whole passage, all of this is because Jesus, who, when all hope seemed gone, all all gone, when, when, when all hope was gone, he conquered death and hell on our behalf. The disciples ran. They were running scared on Friday. Little did they know what God was up to. And then he rose again on Sunday, conquering again death and hell on our behalf. The same, listen, is happening in your life right now. You cannot see what he's doing, but he's at work, friends. There's a reason we have hope. It's because Christ has overcome the grave. We have a victorious Savior. Amen? We pursue him. We set our minds on him. And we live in light of that. Romans 8, 37, no, in all things then, we're more than conquerors. We're more than victorious through him who loved us. And so your life is temporary. Live with the end in sight. Your knowledge is finite. Your vision is limited. Trust the Lord. Your Savior is victorious. And so as we we land this, therefore, your faith is steadfast. Your faith is steadfast. I believe it, so I said it. I love that in verse 13. Listen, you need to get into the habit of speaking, listen, speaking into your soul. Don't don't just listen to your soul. Speak to your soul. It's what the psalmist does. Why are you downcast, oh, my soul? Lift up your head. Be encouraged, oh, my soul. We sang it earlier. Let's just cry out to God, sing praise to him, speak into your soul. Again, many of us are are not in the word of God. We're filling our hearts, our soul with the things of this world. And this is why Paul says the world is blinded because they have not focused on the truth, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with him. He says we can live steadfast, unchanging, unwavering faith because, the, listen, the focus is not our faith. The Bible says you're going to have the faith of a mustard seed. It's, see, our focus is not our faith, but in whom our faith rests. He's unchanging. He's unwavering regardless of what's happening in your life personally. My faith has found a resting place. Amen? And it's not in device or creed. It's not in self-help. It's not in religion. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. Say it with me. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. He does not change. Regardless of what's happening in your life, our faith is in him. You can trust him today. And to have faith in him means we must trust him, which means we must obey him. Here's the key question I want you to think on today. Have current times and troubles revealed that you have actually placed your faith in things other than Christ himself? I think this is certainly true. 
it seems, for the church in America today. The more I see and hear believers fretting over all things, we're losing our place in the culture. We no longer have cultural power. We can no longer claim supremacy in certain domains. Listen, when did we start to think that God had to co-opt with the government in order to advance the kingdom of God in this nation? Friends, listen, we're fretting over so much today. That has never been the way God works. Many of us have come to believe that if we could just get our man or our woman in the White House, then finally we'll see revival in the land. Listen, God shares his power with no one. He didn't come to take sides. He came to take over the hearts of his people, proclaiming him the Lord over all. You know this, do you not? In a world where Christians are being persecuted around the world, where the the Christians are being persecuted, where the gospel is flourishing. It's always been that way. It's what Paul is saying here. We may be beat down. We don't look like much. It looks like we're about to lose, but that's only so that God can receive the glory when he wins. And this is where we are as a church. God is raising us up. We must continue to rescue one another from cultural Christianity to follow Jesus every day because many of us in the church in America has become more cultural in our Christianity than we have biblical. And I'm so grateful for the way that we teach God's word here in our church. So many of you have been faithful even today. You've already been in a connect group seeking to apply the word with others. That's why I say earlier, many of us, we're watching the news. We're listening to the world. We're listening to what's happening instead of listening to the Spirit of God. So I think of our students today, many of you starting a new school year. What are you anxious about? What are you fearful about? Is it your performance? Is it the approval of others, approval of your friends? You see how your anxiety, our worry points us to our idols. And God wants to destroy those idols in our lives for our good and to his glory. So what do we do as we close? Listen, believe. Believe. You say, no, Jeff, come on. I got got a list. What what else do I need? Believe is where it starts. Many of you know the story of Jairus' daughter, perhaps. He, his daughter's dying. He comes to Jesus, and he says, if I have faith, if you, if you will just touch her, if you'll come, you can heal her. And those around Jairus, he's, they say to him, don't bother the master. She's already dying. She's as good as dead. And then Jesus says to him, look at this. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. Listen, Jesus is overhearing us. He's overhearing the talk among his people. He he sees where we place our trust. He hears us fretting over loss of power or position, our anxiety and worry, and he says, listen, listen, don't be afraid. Believe. Trust in me. But your belief must be accompanied by action. I want you to commit yourself anew. If you're here in the Dallas area or wherever you may find yourself in a local church, worship weekly. Commit today to be here next week. Connect weekly in one of our Bible study groups. Serve regularly. Multiply as a lifestyle. Let us teach you how to train others to walk with the Lord. That is a life worth living. That is how we turn the tide in our culture, in our nation. Do not fear. The most repeated command in all of Scripture. Why is that? Well, one, one is implied, one reason. Uh, we're fearful people. But the second is more explicit. That command is almost always followed with, because I'm with you. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. 
I am with you because God is with you. You do not need to fear. He loves you. He will not let you go. He has good plans for you. Forfeit fear for faith in the one who will not leave you. Friends, listen. As you live by faith, you experience peace. And you start to understand that peace is found in a person. And his name is Jesus. It's why he says to us, and I close with this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I want you to close your eyes, bow your heads with me as we come to a moment of commitment. The Lord has been speaking in your heart this morning through our music, through the prayers, through all that's happening, through his word now, through this message. Listen. You will not find, a pe- you will not find peace apart from him because it does not exist. Come home to peace. Come home to Jesus. Friend, if you have never placed your faith in Christ, there's a decision you need to make. If you've never received his grace by faith, not by your works, not by knowledge, but by faith based on what he has already done for you, you can receive his grace right now. Just say, Lord, come into my heart. I give you my life. Give him your life right now. Some of you need to commit to join in the fellowship of this great church. Or maybe if you're from out of town, you need to commit to a group of believers. Do so even now. Act upon it. It'll change your life. Lord, we give you our lives. It's the only thing that we can do. We trust you. We forfeit our fear for faith in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.